those that have been defined to be at risk and have even uh, got on an ICD because of that. And so let's look on how uh, our attitude is and how uh, recent data uh, may have an impact on that attitude. Uh, when we look at people with an ICD and we talk about sports participation, um, there's a number of concerns. And I always list uh, these six concerns, which is one, uh, what will be the risk of damage to the device or the lead? Uh, what will happen when there is loss of consciousness because of an arrhythmia, but maybe also because of the shock? Um, what will be the effectiveness of shocks when arrhythmias occur during intense physical exercise? There is some concern and data uh, that feed that concern. Um, we know that exertion may induce arrhythmias, and so that's also a reason to uh, be concerned about ICD patients doing sports. What will be the likelihood for inappropriate shocks? And finally, sports may contribute to the progression of the underlying disease. And because of all these concerns, uh, in fact, the official recommendations, both at the European side and the American side, are um, rather conservative, and they restrict competitive sports to very minor sports. You can hardly call it sports, according to some. And they are a little bit more lenient for leisure time sports. There we allow to uh, do some sports with moderate cardiovascular demand, but also not uh, intensive cardiovascular demand. And that's, of course, uh, highly restrictive. And that is based on these six concerns. But these six concerns were mainly driven by opinion, uh, not so much by data, and definitely not by any prospective data. And so I think a big change, or some change, uh, I could say, is uh, coming from the ICD registry that was started in the US, and it's uh, the, mainly Dr. Rachel Lampert who has been the driving force behind this registry. And we were lucky enough in Europe, after the registry had started in the States, to join uh, that uh, registry, and we also brought in some patients from Europe. In total now, the registry has included, as you can see, about uh, 440 uh, patients in the US and 123 patients in uh, Europe. Um, and uh, no, we have 190 patients, but we have um, contributed not only competitive athletes, which was the original registry, but we have extended inclusion also to the, these recreational athletes, people that want to bike on Sunday morning with their ICD, and that uh, may be uh, biking uh, in group, and maybe doing that at a high uh, intensive level, which is beyond the current recommendations. And all these patients were included in the registry, well knowing that they were participating to competitive or leisure time sport uh, in, uh, uh, despite the recommendations uh, telling them not to do so. Now, we have published the interim report and data from this registry uh, last year, and my presentation is mainly on how this same data set, nevertheless, is being interpreted a little bit differently at both sides of the Atlantic. And um, Dr. Lambert is from Yale. Uh, we are sitting at the European side. And even when we look at the same data, we uh, have some uh, differing views on that. And that makes it not embarrassing. I think that's something which makes it rewarding, because you will see that there is more than just data that have to guide us in this field. What has the registry published uh, last year? Well, we reported on 372 athletes. Um, all of them uh, were participating in organized sports. Some of them, 137, were competing at a high level with an average of 13 hours of sports per week. We have a median follow-up of two and a half years, median age about 33 years, 42% was secondary prevention. That means that 58% is primary prevention. They never had an arrhythmia before. And intriguingly is that 62% of these competitive athletes were taking beta blockers um, despite them uh, competing and many at a higher level. What was the primary endpoint of the registry? It was looking at death or resuscitated death. And in those 372 competing athletes, after two and a half years, we had not one primary endpoint. And this was beyond expectations even when we started the registry. 
We had some secondary endpoints, uh, which uh, one uh, was arrhythmia or shock-related injury. As you can see, also none of those occurred uh, over those two and a half years. No moderate injury even. And we also uh, predefined as a secondary endpoint to look at uh, lead malfunctions. And of course, we have no randomized uh, trial here. We have just registry. Uh, but when we look at lead survival, in fact, um, over these two and a half years, that was comparable to what we see in historical controls. There was one group that jumped out, but we know that also uh, from controls. That was uh, uh, those people that had a Fidelis lead, they had more often uh, a lead failure. Interestingly, we could not find a relation so far in this interim report between intense arm activity uh, due to sports or contact sports and lead dysfunction. So this is all very, very reassuring and as I said, uh, beyond our expectations uh, when we looked at it. And the interpretation, I must say, at the other side of the ocean is um, uh, uh, looked at with, look, this uh, can be done. Sports is not a problem with an ICD. We can allow our athletes to be much more uh, free in, in their recommendation to sports. Now, in Europe, I must say, we have a little bit a different view, and that is because of some buts. And the first is that, in fact, 21% of the athletes receive shocks over those two and a half years. And the majority of those develop their shocks during physical activity, and highly significantly so. Now, some of them develop those shocks appropriately. They had ventricular arrhythmias. Again, 8%, the majority of those, were uh, developing those shocks or those, those arrhythmias during physical activity. Activity and that's mainly in forms like ARVC uh, where that was happening. But a similar proportion as those that had appropriate shocks also had inappropriate shocks, 11%. And again, you see that the majority of those inappropriate shocks occur during physical activity. So the concern that physical activity contributes to arrhythmias or to inappropriate shocks is somehow proven by the registry. Um, and uh, that comes out. Some of these athletes, and we know that, have repetitive shocks. They have rhythmic storms. A ventricular arrhythmia is stopped by an intervention, but then soon after a new arrhythmia starts, eight episodes occurred of what we call such VT storm in seven athletes. Seven out of these eight episodes occurred during physical activity in sports. And then you can say, well, okay, this may happen, but no primary endpoint, no major um, um, uh, problem arises from that, no death, no injury. But if you look at the data, then you see that 30% of those athletes who received shocks, in fact, stopped their sports activity. So somehow it must have impacted. That's the way that we read those data at the European side. And shocks and inappropriate shocks have many causes, but when you look at causes for inappropriate shocks, in fact, most of these causes are uh, influenced and are promoted by physical activity. So it's not of a surprise that these uh, athletes have shocks and have inappropriate shocks. And these shocks, and that's our concern at the European side, more than at the American side, they have a psychological impact. As we've seen, 30% of the athletes have stopped their sports participation. And sometimes this can even lead to an aversion of the individual for the ICD because it leads to shocks. It's psychologically not uh, fun to, to, to have these. They have a fear for repeat shocks and sometimes a, an aversion for their therapy. Nevertheless, we admit that we have implanted this ICD as a life-saving therapy. And so we have to balance the effect of these shocks against the life-saving uh, property of the ICD in the long term. And so we have to keep the confidence of our individuals, of our patients, into their treatment, which is an ICD. And so again, more at the European side than at the uh, American side, we will uh, uh, give weight to that sort of consideration. Nevertheless, we recognize that sports and physical activity by itself also has 
positive psychological effects. And that's why the recommendation in Europe was already to allow moderate uh, cardiovascular demand sports with an ICD. But maybe there is a concern to push that too far and, and to really uh, uh, have more development of shocks that may have a psychological impact. There are also some other unknowns. Although this is the largest data set and it's 372 athletes, there's still many unknowns. Uh, for instance, uh, um, underlying problems that uh, we know are um, more prone to uh, physical activity induced arrhythmias like ischemia, CPVT, there are only very few athletes in the registry so far. There's also very few athletes with a decreased ejection fraction. The ejection fraction on average was normal. So if we have an ICD patient who wants to sport with a decreased ejection fraction, the registry does not give us uh, full data yet. We also do uh, not know in how far the shocks that occurred in our athletes will in the long term impact their prognosis. In the electrophysiological world, there's more and more data that shocks by themselves may negatively impact the prognosis of patients. So that indicates that we may have to prevent shocks as much as we can. And since we discussed that physical activity contributes to shocks and this may have an impact on their long-term prognosis, this is a concern which is not settled yet with the data. We don't know what to do in children. There were uh, uh, very few children in the registry. We don't know anything about the subcutaneous ICD. It's a, a, a way of uh, treating phys uh, patients without the need for a lead implanted via the veins. It's attractive in an athletic population, but the registry does not give us data on sensitivity and specificity of these devices and athletes. And also a concern uh, that is uh, there in some athletes that is that the sports participation itself may contribute to development of the underlying disease is not dealt with in the registry um, and that is some a medical concern uh, that can never be answered by such a registry. So when we are confronted with an athlete uh, today, uh, well, we have in fact still these six considerations that we have to go over. And when this is, for instance, a long QT3 uh, carrier, a sodium uh, channel, um, a, a potassium channel mutation who is asymptomatic and he wants to do some recreational running, well, then we can say, well, the risk for damage to the lead of the device, that probably um, is answered by the registry. It may be low. Uh, losing consciousness when you're running is not that dangerous, so also there maybe there is no problem. Uh, what is the effectiveness if the ICD needs to shock during sports? There the registry has provided us with valuable data. The induction of arrhythmias will be very low in this type of long QT patients, so that is not a, a problem. The likelihood for inappropriate shocks, um, well, there is still that concern, and the registry has shown us that, and, but it may be not too much in, in this LQ33 carrier, and the progression of this substrate here definitely is not a concern. So maybe if you uh, line these up, you can say, well, probably this athlete can do sports. But if, at the other hand, you have an ARVC athlete that had already uh, a prior VT, so it's secondary prevention, and he wants to do competitive soccer, uh, well, then maybe we are uh, uh, less lenient and we have more concern, and some of this concern comes also from data, as I discussed with you, and maybe the conclusion is that we better not do it. Another difference across the ocean is the attitude uh, towards the decision level that the athlete may have. And you can say, well, the registry provides us with data. We can explain to the athlete what is the risk of competing with the ICD. And then the athlete can make an informed and a better informed decision now that we have the registry data. Um, in Europe, we are a little bit more concerned about what is the personal freedom of a competitive athlete. There is a lot of pressure from the surrounding uh, on such an athlete, as we all know. And so in Europe, we will uh, more rapidly say that society somehow has a place uh, in making up also the decision uh, maybe for the athlete. And that's something which is really heresy when you tell that uh, to Americans. And um, you ha have to also acknowledge that when we as physicians have an un, um, nuanced 
message to our athlete that with the ICD you definitely can do sports because the registry has shown it, that also by doing that to the athlete we take away part of the personal freedom. You have to think that through. But we have to give a balanced view, I think, uh, and not just tell the patient, well, look, it's all safe, you can go ahead, because that also is taking away some of the decision freedom. The surrounding of the athlete is another important concern. Uh, in Europe, we will lend more weight also to what people around the athlete think. And for an individual, uh, that will be the partner and the family. For people in organized sports, that may be the team uh, where uh, competitors may be concerned about what may happen, how they have to deal with it, maybe even some risk for them uh, when uh, their, their teammate has a problem. And uh, there's also, of course, uh, legal and public relations considerations. And we will, again, in Europe, I think, more easily lend some um, ear uh, to, or to these uh, surrounding uh, people, the, the entourage, to make the final decision. Another thing is that when we make a decision together with the athlete, because that's probably the best way to do it, um, we always have to be concerned that we do not present this as a black or white decision. And too often, I think, that's a big mistake. We tell the, the athlete, you may compete or you may not compete. Well, there is many grays in between, and uh, we can also help these athletes to find new directions in life, maybe with some restriction on their competition or sports level, but there is many shades of gray, and um, the, these athletes can have uh, many uh, other tasks. And we heard already from Dr. Laulus also that uh, as an athlete that was not eligible for competition anymore, then it became a, a sort of a coach in the team. And I always discuss immediately and up front before I make any decision with the team physicians and also with the team managers that they have to develop a plan B for the athlete. And so then it becomes not a black and white decision, but it becomes like a career uh, transition. And uh, that is a much more positive uh, evolution than just saying, yes, you can or no, you cannot. So to conclude and to finish my presentation, we have these registry data. I think it's very important that we have them. them. It's uh, very valuable data. But like all evidence-based medicine, the definition of evidence-based medicine is that you should try to combine the best available evidence. And we have uh, provided some with the registry with our physician insights and skills in talking to our athletes. The six considerations still apply and also the personal values and preferences of the patient, of the team, and of society at large. And there is no good and bad here. There is no right and wrong. And there may be different opinions across the Atlantic, and I think that only can uh, make the world richer. I thank you very much.